Oh my goodness, such a dramatic storm has just decided to start right as I've started filming this video, so hopefully the roof doesn't blow off. But hello everyone, happy new year. I hope you had such a lovely Christmas, whatever you were doing, whether you were celebrating or working or resting, whatever you were doing, happy new year, I hope it was a good one. I um, I haven't filmed a video in about three and a half weeks, so this feels very bizarre. I feel like I'm still kind of finding my feet with everything, so bear with me today. But today's video is gonna be one that I've wanted to, I've kind of, well, I've needed, I think, to do for a really long time. I um, I feel like I've needed a reset for a really, yeah, a really long time. I feel like I've got lots of things that have piled up. I've got lots of plant stuff that I've just kind of been doing a little bit half-heartedly. I've got, I'm looking at one in fact right there, I've got things that have needed tackling for a little while now and I've just for some reason been finding every excuse under the sun not to do them. So today is the day that I face the challenges and hopefully make a lot of progress. But first, if you're new here, hi my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learnt over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And yeah, if you've got planty stuff to be getting on with, then please feel free to do it along with me. If you've just got general, like, boring household bits that you've been putting off as well, then let this be your sign. We could do it together. Hopefully it will be fun. And yes, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. I barely even started filming this video and I've already thrown soil all over the floor. I um, I thought it would be a good kind of like therapeutic thing to start with, just cleaning my potting mat because I haven't done it in I don't even know how long and I opened it up to do it and I didn't realise there was actually a load of soil in here. Uh, I don't know why I'm so bad at cleaning my potting mat. I know I always say that it is something you should stay on top of because obviously bacteria, pests, they can spread very quickly if you don't clean it regularly, but I'm just not very good at it. So I thought I'll give it a good wipe down. I'm just using some horticultural soap mixed with water and rubbing alcohol. And I think that should probably do the trick. Just get it looking nice and clean again for the new year. Because yeah, as I say, I haven't filmed, I haven't filmed a video in weeks now. And I had loads and loads and loads of ideas that I wanted to, like Christmassy things that I wanted to do before the year was out. And everything just went a little bit tits up. Me and Ross, we basically, I, I'm guessing it's probably COVID that we had, but we just got this horrible, horrible fluey bug. He got it first, in fact, and he was really quite unwell. And I got it about three days later and it just went on and on and on. And I've spoken to a few people that had something similar recently and it does, honestly, it just drags more than anything I think I've ever had before in my life. Because we got it about a week before Christmas and we were saying, well, at least, at least that means that we will be better for Christmas itself. At least we'll still be able to enjoy Christmas. And it went on for about three weeks in total. I mean, it did get better towards the end, but we just felt so groggy. So annoyingly, we were, we were sick over Christmas and that just kind of meant that obviously like work stuff, making videos, stuff like that, that completely went out the window. But also just things in my plant collection in general have just spiraled a little bit in this time because I had, I guess like a little bit of plant burnout towards the end of the year anyway. And I was desperately trying to get back on top of stuff. And I actually was starting to kind of feel like I was making progress. And then we got ill and everything that was already kind of in need of a bit of TLC just got, just got left. So I've got a lot of drama now that I've been looking at. And I don't know, I just, you know, like, you know, when you leave something for so long, you then just feel so bad about it that you almost 
I was gonna say don't want to do anything about it. I know that's a weird way of explaining it, but I guess it's just like blocking that thing out and hoping it'll go away. I've got quite a lot of things that I am feeling that way about. And I know that realistically a lot of them, I mean, most of them are very manageable and will not take that much time at all. So I just kind of need to get on and do them. And I feel like in terms of going back to what I was saying about holding myself accountable, if I could try and make one of my, not resolutions as such, but one of my healthier habits going into this year, maybe starting each month with doing a little mini reset in my collection, I think I would mentally feel much better. Because I think a lot of the things like, I mean, really basic things like cleaning my potting mat and stuff like that. There is just something about doing those things that does just like clear your mind. It's like when they like, I don't know what the phrase is exactly, but like clean home, clean mind or whatever it is. It does. And I know that it does actually really make a difference. I'm just not very good on the whole at doing it. Okay, perfect. Look how lovely and clean that is. And that took all of about three minutes. So I think I can definitely make time to do that more often. Cool, so right, I'm gonna set myself up at the table and we can start working through some planty things. So I've also done something that I should absolutely do more and for some reason I just never really do, but I have written myself an actual list of things that I want to get through today and I have absolutely got more things that I could add to this list, but I feel like this is like a manageable, a manageable amount to get through and then if I whiz through them then I can always tackle some more things. I've already spotted something else that's not on my list but desperately needs doing. My Monstera Dubia moss pole really, really, really needs extending. I can see that this section here is starting to put out aerial roots and it currently doesn't have anything to grow into. So if I've got time today and I've got all the right materials, that is definitely something, definitely something that I need to do because I am just literally loving how that plant is growing for me at the moment. I'm so proud of it and I'd really like to get it continuing to size up this year. I just trod on the dustpan and brush and spilled the soil that I've just swept up all over my foot. So I thought it was a good idea to start off with just giving my prop box here. I want to give the lid a good clean up and I want to, I mean, I wouldn't really be choosing to start a propagation box this time of year, but I have got several plants that are going to need chopping up and starting again. So I thought a new prop box was probably a good way to go. And this is just the, the one, the box that I took everything out of in my Christmas video when I made my little Christmas wonderland and um, it's to be honest it's been fine it's just been a sphagnum moss perlite propagation box I think I'm going to keep it as the same but the lid is a little bit grotty and I don't think light can pass through it that well so I'm just going to give that a little wipe over before I start putting more stuff into the box um, but yeah, like I say, me and Ross were really not well over Christmas and that actually, oh my God, there was such a dramatic night where Ross got up to go to the toilet in the night. This is before I was unwell. I hadn't come down with it yet. He got up to go to the toilet in the night and I think it was about three o'clock in the morning and I just heard this ginormous crash and I shouted out for him and I, I, he didn't say anything and I was like, oh my God. So I went down and I knocked on the bathroom door, nothing. And I opened the door and he had just passed out and landed in the washing basket. And it's, it's not exactly like a straightforward fall because my bathroom's got a weird little bit of sloped ceiling that then has a radiator on the wall and this weird little, I'll put a picture in so that you can see, but a weird little corner that has a spike on it, like a really sharp edge where we put the washing basket. And bless him, he like the radiator was like hanging off the wall. So he'd obviously hit that pretty hard when he went down and he's got a massive bruise on his hip from where he hit the corner. And it could have been so much worse, but I um, I went in there and I was 
trying to get him to respond to me and he was completely unresponsive. His eyes were open and I obviously just completely freaked out and ended up calling the ambulance. And in the end, they didn't need to come out. They just put it down to dehydration because obviously it's like fluey. I won't go into detail, but like lots of sweating. Um, and luckily he was fine, but it gave us a proper, proper fright. Um, so yeah, that was a pretty sleepless night. And then I went down with it the next morning. So yeah, it's such a shame really. We were so excited because this was obviously our first Christmas that we were spending together. And don't get me wrong, like we had lovely moments within it, but they were mainly just kind of like curled on the sofa with duvets and not how we pictured it, let's just say that. Um, but we did have one day where I think this was just after Christmas where we started to feel a little bit better. And I don't know like if anybody else does this, but I feel like when you get, when you get really ill, you it's, it's so hard to imagine what it feels like to be well again. And we had a day where we were just feeling a little bit perkier and we just decided to do like all of the household stuff and like really get on top. And we, we decided to, wash all the sofa cushions and everything because we'd been we, we decided not to sleep on the mezzanine that we put up because we were like climbing up and down the ladder is probably not that sensible um so we decided to wash all the sofa cushions because we've been sleeping on the sofa and we decided to wash the rug the rug that is usually where i'm sat now and is not here anymore uh, and we thought maybe the rug could fit in the washing machine and it was just a little bit too big so we got it in the bath and we were like treading on it and trying to get it clean that way and I feel like we started with so much energy but because we still weren't that great we just fatigued really really quickly um, and eventually managed to get this rug clean and then we were like how the hell are we going to dry it um, so we just put it over the balcony outside and then it rained that night and I'm really ashamed to say that the rug is still there and that was like a week ago now so I think I probably need to take it to a dry cleaners and get it sorted that way but it's just been so like I don't know why it's just caused me so much anxiety like going to bed that night I was like oh my god what are we going to do about the rug um and realistically it's a very small it's a, it's a very small problem to have it's just very sad to see it now just sat out there and it is again raining so so yeah i need to do that need to do that fairly soon but i actually was thinking since the rug has gone from this area although it's not as cozy there's i don't know there's something about it that just like i guess it's just more minimal and i feel like I feel like this year maybe a little bit more minimal is a good thing because I know, like I've spoken about it before, but I've got ADHD. I can get overwhelmed by things very, very easily. I think a lot of the time that's where my plant burnout comes from. It's where, I, like I said earlier, like I'll see something going downhill and I just won't do something. I won't do anything about it or I'll leave it until it is literally on the brink of death before I do anything. I'm so bad at leaving things to the last minute and yeah, going on tangents like I'm doing now. Um, but I feel like creating a slightly more minimal lifestyle this year is is probably going to be a really, really, really good thing for me. And I know this is stupid that this started with me saying about the rug, but just like mentally, there's something about this area now that feels easier to keep on top of. Like if I'd spilt that soil on the rug, it would have been harder to clean up. So I think maybe just having a bit of a, like a general declutter would be a really good way to start this year. And I think that kind of applies to my plant collection as well. And not that there's anything that I like massively want to part with, but I've got like, I've got a cabinet full of issues at the moment and I've got some plants in there that I, I'm kind of waiting for them to grow on me but I'm kind of <laughs> waiting for them to, I don't know, like waiting for them to make me happy because I feel like they should, or I feel like they will at some point. And I'm kind of just thinking, why don't I let, I, I think I should learn to, to let certain things go so that I can appreciate other things that I've got more. Um, and I know that obviously in this last year, I've been living completely by myself. I've had no one telling me that I can't buy plants. And believe me, Ross, if anything, encourages my hobby, which is pretty great. But I've I've gone a little bit mad just because it's been the first time in my life that I can just like get all the plants. 
Uh, and I'm not saying I won't do that this year. Um, also, I've just made a sphagnum moss prop box and as we go through, I will be chopping things up and putting them in. Starting with my Susie Q, which is very sad, but it definitely needs to start again from scratch. Um, but yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm not saying that I won't be buying more plants this year, but I think just creating, yeah, creating some space so that I can love the ones I've got more because I have found, especially towards the end of last year, there have been lots of moments where I found plant care a little bit overwhelming and I don't want to be feeling like that about it. I love my plants more than anything. But I've always kind of said, if it gets to the point where it's feeling like a little bit too much, then I will, I'll, I'll readjust because why would I want it to be a stressful hobby? You know, why would I want it to be stressing me out all the time? Um, and I think, yeah, I think I, I brought a lot of plants into my life before my life was as full maybe as it is now. Like I, I share my evenings with someone else now, which is so lovely, but it's also, it means that I, I don't like regularly get to have like really long plant care evenings to myself. And I'm totally, totally, totally fine with that. I, as I say, I love things the way that they are, but I think I would like to just kind of adjust a little bit so that I am not feeling, I'm not feeling like, okay, you should be doing this or you were doing that before because that's just making me feel bad about myself. And why on earth should I let it make me feel bad about myself? You know, does that make sense? Does that make sense what I'm saying? I feel like that makes sense to me. Um, but very quickly, back to plants. Um, the story of my Hoya Susie Q that I am currently chopping up is very, very, very sad. It is a Hoya that I absolutely love and it was so long, so beautiful. And I put it, uh, so this is actually a problem that started way before Christmas. I um, I mentioned it in a Patreon video, but I put, I trained this plant to climb above my radiator, like on the back wall of this room, and it looked so beautiful there. And then I said in that video, I went away for a couple of nights and I don't know what happened to the heating. I don't know if maybe I meant to flick it off and I flicked it on or like it was messed with somehow, but the heating was just blasting for days on end and this plant because it's right above the radiator usually if I run my humidifier alongside it it's absolutely fine but it just got obliterated and so lots of leaves are looking very dry and crispy uh, and this section at the end this was kind of like just after the radiator so this bit is still alive but I thought starting from scratch with this plant was probably the best thing to do. I could just prune it back and have lots of like bare bits of vine, but I don't particularly want to do that. So yeah, I think I could just pot them straight up in soil, to be honest. Should I do that? I was going to say I put them in the pot box. Um, I think while I'm trying to create less work for myself, I will start them in the prop box. If I decide that I want to take them out and put them into soil or semi-hydro or something in the next like few days, few weeks, then I can absolutely do that. But that's just like essentially creating a new plant to monitor. So I don't think I'm going to do that for the time being. But yeah, it is one that propagates really easily in pretty much any substrate, to be honest. So I could, I could totally just get it going as a, as a new plant, as is. But yeah, oh my goodness, this is really sad actually, because I don't have that many sections compared to what I did before. That's all of them. But I do think all of them will root pretty well. I hope they do anyway, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna lay them down in the prop box. And I have also got something else to go into this new prop box, which is very sad. And again, this is something that I um, I was looking at again before I, before I got ill and I was thinking, oh my God, that needs doing. Um, and I moved, I can't remember why, but I moved a load of plant, oh, I think, I think it's probably when we were trying to get the rug dry. Um, I moved a load of stuff over there to create more space here. And this just got hidden behind other plants and it's now looking awful. 
Um, it is my Philodendron Ernestii, and obviously this leaf is about to go. Lots of other leaves have gone. And I, I, was like, I kind of like, I think in a way, it's quite good that I'm having a reset with this plant because I've said it before in other videos, but sometimes if there's a plant that I find myself just ignoring or I'm not feeling like I'm keeping on top of that much, sometimes chopping it completely back and starting from scratch is the way to go. And I have absolutely fallen in love with plants again, doing it that way. I know I just said if I'm not completely in love with a the plant, then I need to just pass it on, but I do love the Philodendron Ernesti. I just don't know why I, I've, I've just let it get really bad to the point that it is not looking like much of a plant anymore. Uh, but I'm just gonna take some wet stick cuttings and again, I'm gonna just pop them into the prop box, pop the area where it's facing down in the prop box. And then yeah, hopefully I can come back to it in a month or two and I can start the plant again if I want to. If I don't, I can absolutely pass it along, but I feel like I will want to start it again because there's been points, there's been times where this has been one of my favorite plants in my collection. Yeah, it just has been a little bit of a, I don't want to say neglect full time, but I, I've just been focused on, focused on things that are not so planty. That being said, I know I'm, I'm talking very negatively. Um, there are a lot of things happening in my collection that are quite exciting as well. You might be able to see my Anthurium regal is giving me a lovely new leaf. I've got some beautiful new growth as well, but I just think like, I think my standards are probably a little bit too high, but I know what everything can look like when it is flourishing and it's healthy. And obviously we are also very much out of growing season. I've been battling with humidity, with not a lot of light, natural light. I think it's, it's absolutely okay to be having more issues at this time of year, but I think it's more just, I'm just a little bit annoyed at myself because I know I could have done more. But the point is I'm doing something about it now, so. It's not the end of the world, is it? Okay, cool. So that is what the start of this new prop box is currently looking like. As I say, I might add more stuff to it as I kind of go round the flat because I'm sure I'm going to find other things that might need chopping up. Um, but the next thing on my list it's just, and this might not seem particularly urgent, but it's more just like a practicality thing. I propagated this section of my Raptor for a Tetra Sperma, which in fact was in the same place as my Hoya Susie Q was, so maybe it's just like a jinxed spot for plants. Um, but I took a massive cutting of this, I think about maybe five, six weeks ago now, and it's rooted amazingly in water. It's got fantastic roots and it's definitely ready to be potted up. And it is one that would be fine if I was to leave it in water for a little bit longer. But the main reason I want to pot it up is just because it's so top heavy. And I cannot even tell you how many times this has been knocked over in the last few weeks. Literally, we have spilt water so many times. But I think I'm probably going to stick with this container. I'm just going to go and give it a little rinse out because it's just got murky water in there at the moment. So bear with. And then, yeah, as I say, I am going to go in with semi-hydro for this one. And the last time I tried to put this plant into semi-hydroponics is when it went downhill. But I, looking back at that, I do think there were already underlying issues with this plant. A lot of its leaves were kind of yellowing towards the bottom. And I think I just shifted up its environment too much when it was already kind of on its way out, if that makes sense. So I'm going to make this kind of a gradual transition. I'm gonna keep it in exactly the same spot as it was in before. And I'm just gonna monitor it very, very, very carefully because I love this plant and I've already lost a lot of length on it. But it is very fast growing when it's kept in the right condition. So I'm hoping in maybe like four months time, it might be back to how it was before. Perfect. Yeah, that's 
definitely much more weighty and hopefully won't be knocked as easily. I mean, to be honest, I, I was going to say, because of the way that I've been growing this plant, it might be weird that I haven't staked this or put it on a moss pole or anything. But what I've basically been doing is I've just been feeding it through the handles of my... Um, I was gonna say doors. It's a door that I never opened to outside, one of my balcony doors. And it's just kind of been holding it up quite nicely like that. And it has been growing well like that. So for the time being, I'm just gonna let it continue to grow in that way. But I should probably at some point reevaluate. I guess I could just add in a bamboo stake or something at a later stage if I want to. But yeah, cool. Um, and then I brought this one over as well. This is actually one that's not on the list. I am digressing already. Uh, but this is my Aglaonema tigress. And this is a really lovely Aglaonema, but again, it's one that has just been really neglected. It lives on the, um, the little stand I've got over there in the corner. It's on top of that. Um, and because when the main door to the living room is open, I don't always see that stand. This plant has just got really, I was going to say neglected, but also I think it just hasn't really had any natural light. It's already in a low light spot. And although it is a low light plant, I think because the doors have just kind of been keeping it in almost like a little tented area, it just has not been receiving as much light as it needs at all. So I'm just gonna trim back the yellowing leaves and I'm just gonna move it slightly closer to my window and monitor it for the next few weeks. And if things don't, change or if I notice the plant continuing to go downhill then I'll get it out and I'll have a look at the roots but I'm pretty sure that is what's going on there and in fact I've got one of my big snake plants over kind of closer to the window just next to me and I'm wondering if maybe I swapped them that might be a better option because I have already got a Sansevieria moonshine in that corner that's doing really well so maybe I'll try that. But yeah, so that's not perfect. And I know it's looking a little bit straggly, but I think with a good water and a little bit more light, that should be enough to bring the plant back. But I will keep you updated with it. Um, but yeah, right, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna swap the positions of those plants. And then the next thing on my list, oh God, is my Alocasia Portadora, which I'll bring in from outside because she's been outside for like a week and a half. I will bring her in from outside and then I will talk you through, I was going to say talk you through the plan with her. I don't know the plan yet. We will figure it out together. Big. I think that'll do for now. I know that's a plant that will absolutely survive and be happy there. I guess I can always have another shift around. I can always have another shift around if I want to. For now, I'm going to keep that there. Look at the rug, it's fallen off again. <laughs> I also just realised I left my Nepenthes outside and I did not mean to do that overnight. Uh, whenever it rains, I always put this one outside because it loves rainwater or distilled water, but I did not mean to forget about it. Luckily, it looks okay. But my Alocasia Portadora, I'm holding it there so you can see it. The reason I put it outside is because yet again, I came across spider mites on it. Honestly, I am almost at my wit's end with that plant. I've cut it back so many times. I've completely chopped it back before. I've tried it in different substrates. I've tried it with predatory mites. I've tried everything and it always gets spider mites. And I just didn't have the energy to deal with it when I wasn't well. So I was like, I'm gonna put it outside and see what happens. And one of its leaves has kind of like died back it's broken and I'm gonna I'm gonna just chop it back again I'm gonna start again <sighs> and I want to say if I can't find a way to get it under control maybe that's a plant I'll consider parting with I don't know I love it so much but you know you know when it's just kind of one thing after another that is the one plant in my collection probably my oldest plant as well that is the one plant in my collection that is just 
giving me constant grief. So yeah, I'm gonna chop off its leaves. Those are not coming back in the house. And then I will bring it back in and we can deal with whatever's left of it. Yeah, just look at all the spider mite damage on those leaves. It's one that I just, like, I don't remember when I first got this plant. I don't remember having that many issues with it. Because as I say, this is one that I've had for probably like six years now. I don't remember having problems with it at first, but in the last kind of like two years, it's just been non-stop grief. So I've chopped it back. This is what I'm left with. And I can see it is actually starting to give me a little corm there. It's putting up some new growth. Oh my God. So I'm just gonna empty out the rainwater that's in there because it does not look particularly clean. And then take this section inside and think about what to do next. So I've just mixed up some fresh horticultural soap and water. I think that's probably gonna be the best thing to just give this main stem a wipe over. I mean, I know this bit. Oh, hello, Yuli. Come on. Through you come. Come on. I think, um, yeah, <laughs> hello. This section probably will die back. The reason I haven't chopped it all the way back though is just because uh, this is where the new leaf is gonna grow from. And I feel, I thought I'd just kind of give it a fighting chance. It typically spider mites don't tend to affect the stems of the plant as much. Um, so yeah, here I've just got an old slightly mushy leaf that has been needing to be removed for a while and to be completely honest typically I would say with this kind of plant wear gloves just because it is an alocasia it contains calcium oxalate crystals uh, and they can be very stingy when they get on your skin so I will absolutely go and give my hands a wash after this in fact I'm going to give them a wash before I start in case it stings me yeah, I think I've said before in other videos, but I um, back when this plant was literally bigger than me, which is hard to hard to imagine now. Um, back when this plant was huge, I gave it a really massive chop back at one point, and I wasn't wearing gloves, and my hands were literally burning for ages. It was it was so horrible. So yeah, if I if I do handle it without gloves now, I will absolutely go and wash my hands straight away. Um, so. It's really hard to know what to do with this one. It is currently in semi-hydro. As you can see, it is absolutely rooting out the bottom and I will chop those roots back just so that they don't start to rot. It also would benefit from being potted much lower because this here will put out roots if it is submerged in a substrate. So I'm kind of thinking I don't have anything tall enough because this is really quite big. I don't have anything tall enough and big enough to do that with for now. But what I might do, I'm gonna chop these roots back. I might just wrap some sphagnum moss and cling film around that so that I can hopefully activate some roots. And then I'm still not quite sure what I will do with it because as I say, I love my allocation for Tadora so much. I really love the plant, but it's like, yeah. I don't know if any of you have a plant that is like this, but it is just so ridiculously frustrating when you're treating it time after time after time and the issue just keeps coming back. And I feel like I, like, I feel like I know this plant so well and it's still happening. And it can be next to other plants and other plants are fine and this one is just affected. It's crazy, like I know some people have said and the alocasia jacqueline for example is a magnet for spider mites and yes i have had spider mites on my alocasia jacqueline in the past but nowhere near as bad as it has been on this one Ooh. again i'm just taking off the old leaf this is going to be a washing hands jobby again in a moment there is something very satisfying about it though it's very like succulent and squidgy So yeah, if I just wrap some sphagnum moss around there, 
and then probably get to like order a much bigger pot. Like I almost need a, um, what do you call them? Tower pots. I need a tower pot, but I've never seen one this big. So I'll have a, have a little Google and see what I can find. If any of you have got a place that you get really ginormous tower pots, then please let me know. Um, and also, some of you before have asked about using sphagnum moss alongside semi-hydro because I have spoken about like moss poles and stuff like that before. And typically, so long as the sphagnum moss isn't like going into the semi-hydro, I've never had any issues. Obviously, you do just have to be quite careful because it is an organic matter. And if you mix that with a semi-hydroponic substrate, then it is going to mean that it is more likely to increase the risk of like root rot and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just gonna do my best to keep it, I'm doing a very bad job, um, but just keep it around the rhizome here as much as I can. The sensible thing to have done would have been to cut my piece of cling film first. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> I actually think I need a longer piece of cling film. I thought that would be enough. This is just so beefy now. <laughs> yeah, it's such a shame because as I say, I, I adore this plant. I really do. But it just takes such a long time to pest treat it. Like every single time I have to do it, I spend kind of like 20 minutes kind of scrubbing it front of the leaves, back of the leaves. I've, I've changed out the substrate loads of times. I've, I've changed so many things. And when the issue is literally coming back time after time after time, like within weeks, of, like days to weeks of you doing it, it just kind of, I don't know. I'm like, do I need the drama in my life? I'm not sure I do. Um, I've also done a very bad job of not getting semi-hydro and moss mixed, like I just said. So I'm just picking off any excess sphagnum moss. So yeah, although I'm pretty sure that this plant is now spider mite free, I am going to try and keep it as far away from my other plants as possible. Fortunately, because it doesn't currently have leaves, it's going to be fairly easy to do. I can just pop it in a corner by the window and hopefully that will do the trick. And yeah, like I don't doubt that this plant will give me beautiful growth. It grows so quickly when it's in the right conditions. And even though it's been winter, it has still been giving me some really ginormous growth. So one last try, one last try with this plant. I don't want to part with it. I know I keep saying that, but I really don't want to part with it. But yeah, one last try. I'm gonna put it by the window and hope for the best. And I know I've just put it there. Um, I have actually also just ordered some, some more shelves, like the little bamboo shelves. I've got over, we can't see them very well, but over there, um, just because I had a bit of a rearrange like pre-Christmas time when I thought we were gonna be, before we were ill, and I, th I thought we were gonna have people over and stuff. And I just pulled some of the plants away from the sofa and put them against the window on those shelves. And I was like, this actually makes it feel much more spacious. So I ordered some more of them. I think they are due to arrive tomorrow. So hopefully I can get on building them then. and. Just again, as I say, just declutter, get things in practical places where I'm not like falling over them because it has got a little bit like that round here by the window. I don't mind it, but like I, I can navigate it because I know it very well. If Ross tries to get round there, I can guarantee he'd have a nightmare. If Yoli goes round there, she always knocks stuff over. So yeah, I need to create a more practical space around there. And I was gonna give my potting mat another wipe over, but the next thing I want to do is get into my cabinet. And I know I've got pest treating to do in there. So I think I'm gonna just let my potting mat be grubby for the time being, do my pest treating and then give it another deep clean. <laughs> so I know that things in my cabinet 
are currently not great. As I say, I've had several, several pest issues. I need to order more predatory mites, I really do. But I've seen spider mites in the top of my cabinet. I noticed them just before Christmas, I think, and I've taken a couple of plants out, but I can see them in there again. So just like superficially looking at things, I can't see anything on the bottom level. And everything also does need a water, but I'm gonna worry about that afterwards. What I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take everything out. Oh my God, this is why it's called a reset. I'm gonna take everything out. I'm gonna inspect everything, check it for pests. I've got some more horticultural soap water here. And I'm gonna just go through and I'm gonna treat everything that needs treating. I um, Yeah, I, I suspect there might be quite a few things in here. I suspect there's also gonna be other things that needs just like a general, like generally just a bit of attention because as I say, I haven't been in here in ages. I might also, as I go through, create a pile of stuff that I might consider parting with this year. And I said that because I've just picked this plant up and I kind of feel like I'm ready to get rid of it. This is my Philodendron Yopii. And it, like really sadly, it was doing amazingly for me when I first got it and this one got thrips several times and I've just never, I say I've never been able to get it back. I've never got it back to how it was before and I think part of that is just because I don't care enough about it. So that one looks fine pest wise, but it also is going to go in my pile of, do I want it? Maybe. This one is, oh, this has got a hoya tendril that's grown around it. Um, it's my Alocasia Regal Shield and this absolutely needs to come out of the cabinet. It has definitely outgrown it and probably needs potting up again. Like, oh my God, that reservoir is bone dry and its roots are crazy. And I only repotted this one about two months ago. So yeah, this is the, this is going to go into the pile of need stuff doing to it. Fortunately, pest wise though, it seems to be okay. Oh no, I lie. I've just seen a thrip. Okay, it's going to go into the pest treating pile. Just looking at this one, this one really needs to get on a trellis. This is my Hoya latifolia, and that's the one that was starting to climb around another plant because it's been, it's been wanting to climb for quite a while now and I just haven't got around to doing it. And in fact, I've just had a thought, I've just had a thought, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a note today in this video of everything that I come across that I'm like, ah, oh, that needs doing. And when I start my plant chores videos for the next however long, or even if I do plant chores stuff off camera, I'm gonna start with that list because I feel like I'm always saying, oh, that really needs doing, I really need to do that to that plant. And then I just forget about it because there's so much other stuff. Uh, so yeah, I feel like, in fact, where is my notepad? I will make a note of that now. Okay, so I've just added Hoya Latifolia Trellis and Alocasia Regal Shield Repot to this list. So yeah, I will just make note of stuff as I come across it. And hopefully this will help me kind of form healthier habits. I feel like this is potentially quite a good way of doing things. Because yeah, as I say, I have so many thoughts and so many things that always need attention. I just forget about them. So I'll let you know if this way works. Also, I am so sure that something needs to happen with this plant. This is the Drimiopsis maculata. It's one that I got in the goodie bag from one of the plant swaps earlier this year. It's currently just in sphagnum moss and it absolutely needs hydrating. It is bone dry at the moment, but it's also got a very good root system on it. I would thought it probably needs potting up, but I still need to do some research on this plant because I currently know nothing about it. I'm not gonna put that on the list. Oh, maybe I should. Maybe I should. That is something that I can absolutely do off camera though. That will not be particularly interesting. 
But look how exciting this is. My alocasia, my alocasia, my anthurium regal is finally giving me a really beautiful leaf. And so far, it's looking pretty perfect. It's still very much sizing up. And actually the reservoir is still a little bit full. But one thing I am gonna have to do, because it's so big, it is already pushing up against the grow light and I can see just a little corner of the leaf there has already started to singe. And I don't particularly like changing out a plant's environment like on a major scale when, when it is giving me new growth, especially with one like this that I haven't had the best luck with so far. But I just, I can't fit it in the cabinet anymore. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to take it out. So my thoughts are putting it by the window where I put the Alocasia Portadora. I think, I think that's probably gonna replicate the light it's getting in there to the best of my abilities. And just run my humidifier. I think conditions wise, it's fairly similar. Um, I have actually considered taking this one out of my cabinet for a little while now, so the fact it's actually starting to give me some lovely growth is really, really encouraging. And I really hope it continues to do that. This, um, the leaf it had before, though this one, doesn't actually look as bad on camera, but it's starting to look really, like, way more battered than it was before. It's got loads of browning around the sides of it. I don't, I don't know if that's anything to be worried about. I don't know if that's literally because it's putting out another new leaf and it's using a lot of its energy for that. Um, but I can't see any signs of pests or anything, which is really good. All of the plants that have been in my cabinet, even if they're going into the good pile, I'm absolutely gonna be keeping a very close eye on, just because obviously they have been in the same environment as both thrips and spider mites. So yeah, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily out of the woods with any of them at the moment. This is one as well, I'm like, do I want this plant? It's some type of Hoya. It's very slow to grow. I'm gonna put it in my maybe pile. My Hoya Wilbur Graves absolutely needs to go on the to-do list because look at that. It is literally begging to climb. And again, I just haven't done anything with this plant in such a long time. I did try growing it on a moss pole at one point. Not that I've ever done that with a Hoya before, but I was just like, it's got really good aerial roots. Would it work? It didn't work. But yeah, trellis on the list. And these things, these are another thing I got, I think on the free table at Plant Swap ages ago, and they look like that. They're almost, they're not anthurium berries, I don't think. Or if they are, they're not ripe at all. They're, I, I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. Um, and I've just had them in this little thing since I got them, and I'm thinking I might just throw them into a prop box and see what happens. I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna throw them in the prop box I got earlier. Perfect. They might do something, you never know. But that is the bottom, the bottom of my cabinet cleared out. These are just old predatory mite sachets that have been out of date for I think about three or four months now. So I'm gonna take those out and bin them. As I say, I do need to order some more. Do that tonight, but I'm just gonna take everything out. Oh, exciting update! I've got a very exciting update. So, oh, in fact, I need to deal with it like now. Um, but the little allocate their variegated allocation fry deck corn that I propagated a little while ago has given me its first leaf. I mean, it's all root and leaf at the moment, and it is a ghost leaf, but how beautiful is that? really like to pop that up today as well. God, these things take so much time. Um, okay, I'm gonna put that to the to-do pile. Not pest, but just to-do. Oh my goodness, I was just checking my philodendron penalty lobum for pests and I just accidentally snapped its newest unfurling leaf. Although I do think, although I can't see any pests, 
Do you see the discoloration on that leaf? I suspect there has been some pest activity, especially since the growth it's giving me is nowhere near as healthy as the growth it was giving me. I'm kind of tempted, you know, to just pester the whole of the top of my cabinet. I like, I just feel like if I leave some things, if I leave some things then I'm gonna be cutting corners and I might have to do it again. So I think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm gonna get everything that off my cabinet out and just give it all a wipe over. And this is the main culprit. This is my philodendron fuzzy petiole. I don't know how well you'll be able to see on camera, but it is so spider mighty. It shouldn't even be in the cabinet with the rest of the plants. I um, I treated this plant, I think about maybe two months ago. And I did, I honestly, they must have come back overnight or I just wasn't that vigilant with checking because I checked this plant. I just looked into my cabinet over Christmas and I was like, oh my God, they're back, they're everywhere. And I'm sure this is where they started from. So this one is gonna be treated, but I'm not putting it back into the cabinet for the time being. I think that one's gonna to have to stay in isolation. And isolation is becoming increasingly difficult because I, because I just don't have space to isolate. So again, this is another potential pro of having a little downsize for my collection. I can, as I say, just monitor everything so much better. And um, I'm just looking at my Ethereum Clarinervium. I'm still gonna treat it. But usually, Tests are very quick to show with velvety leaf plants, I find, and I can't actually see any on this one at all. Nevertheless. Oh my goodness, and I've just found mealy bugs on my Hoya Louis Bois. And I don't know how well you'll be able to see because they are quite small, but like all in the little gaps where the leaf meets the main stem, there's loads of them. And they have attacked this plant before. I think what I'm probably gonna do with this one is I think I'm gonna, in fact, let's just do it. Let's just do it, I'll show you what I'm gonna do. So I've just sellotaped up the soil of that plant. I did have a very good look and I can't see any around the roots of the plant so I'm guessing it is just kind of like superficial on the leaves and what I'm going to do, I've just got an empty peanut butter tub, I'm going to fill to about there with rubbing alcohol uh, and then I'm going to fill a little bit of water on top and I'm just going to dunk the plant and I say this, I know it might seem like quite a drastic measure but I have Oh my goodness, so many times gone over with a paintbrush and isopropyl alcohol and just tried to get them all gone that way and they are just continuously coming back. So this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna do. So yeah, alcohol. Well, you know what? I'm not gonna attempt to show you because I feel like I will spill it everywhere. And then a little drop of water as well. So yeah, that is now filled to about there and I'm just gonna get as much of the foliage in as I possibly can, <laughs> she says, and just try and dunk the plant, give it a good slosh around. And I know this isn't particularly good for the plant, but alcohol does kill mealybugs on contact and I feel like maybe I've just been missing them when I've been treating this plant before, so Hopefully this will mean they're gone for good. Again though, it's another one that I'll probably keep out of my cabinet for the time being, just so I can monitor it, keep it away from other plants. And hope that the mealybugs haven't spread. Cool, and now I'm just gonna let it air dry. So just before I sit down to do the pest treating on these plants that are in my cabinet, I thought I'd put a thing on my Instagram story and just ask you guys if you had any questions and I will try and go through them as I do it because I feel like this might be a little bit long and potentially tedious. So I thought, kill two birds with one stone. 
oh, we just clicked on a video. Uh, but yeah, kill two birds with one stone and hopefully make this a little bit more exciting because I find this sort of stuff very boring. Um, but also one update that I wanted to give you, and this is a weird one. So if you watched my birthday plant unboxing, or if you've just watched my videos since then, because I've spoken a lot about it. My Philodendron Esmeraldense that I got is supposedly, it made me feel a little bit better when I heard this, but supposedly a really tricky plant to propagate. Apparently it often rots and mine completely rotted, like the whole node rotted and I was like, there's no way it's gonna do anything. And it started giving me at first what I thought was the start of a little root. And it's actually the start of a new growth point and it is, it's giving me a new leaf, but it has no roots. And I don't see how this is gonna survive. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it might almost be like phantom growth. It might just kind of grow for a little while and then just stop, I'm not sure. But the fact it's doing something is giving me hope and I'm like, is this false hope? I don't know. So, um, so yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm keeping it in this little cup in my cabinet. I was gonna say I could put it into my propagation box, but I am quite enjoying looking at this regularly. So I think I'm gonna carry on doing it like that for the time being. Oh no, I just knocked my Singolium Frosted Heart over and pond's gone everywhere. I'm not going to worry about that too much right now because I do need to, as I say, I need to go through and I need to give all of these plants pretty much a really good water. As you can see, some of them are really curly and they need massively hydrating. But what I'll probably do if I give them all a pest treatment, I can't really isolate all of these plants. I'm going to have to put some back in my cabinets. I think if I keep ones like my philodendron fuzzy petiole that's really badly affected, I'll keep that out and I'll keep the levels still separated because as I say, touch wood, I haven't had any pest issues in the bottom section of my cabinet. I think what I'll do, I'll give everything a treatment. I'll give my cabinet a clean and then I will do all of my watering in the cabinet tonight before putting it all back in. I think that's a good shout. I think that is what I should do. <laughs> oh, okay, so I've just checked and I've had a couple of questions so far. One of you asked, are Swiss cheese monsteras dormant during winter? Um, so no, like no plant is, no plant just goes dormant during winter, except any plant is capable of going dormant. Um, Obviously with something like Monstera Deliciosa because it loves typically bright and direct light, although it can survive in lower lighting conditions, it is gonna grow much slower if you keep it in lower lighting conditions. It prefers slightly warmer temperatures. So if you found that it has gone dormant during winter, then then that is, that, that's normal if you haven't kind of adapted your conditions, if that makes sense. And it's not a bad thing. Like if you if you let your plants go slightly dormant during the winter months and then they spring back into action during growing season, then there's nothing wrong with that. But it is perfectly possible to keep them growing happily and healthily all year round. For example, my um, my big monstera over in the corner, which you can see just there, I've got a grow light on that plant. So although it's not growing as quickly as it does during, during the growing season, during the spring and summer months, it is still giving me some new growth. So that's kind of how I counterbalance that. So yeah, that's that's kind of the answer. On, on the note of plants going dormant though, my, um, my big euphorbias, last year I had them it actually in exactly the same spot as where that monstera is now. I put them there just purely because they were so big. I kept getting caught on them because they were so spiky. And, um, and I had them with a grow light there. And to be honest, it wasn't really enough light for them, but they survived amazingly. And they are plants that, although typically are quite high light plants, they are more than capable of surviving in lower lighting conditions. So although I didn't get much growth from them last year, I've put them by the window this year. And uh, this year, I'm getting years muddled up, summer slash winter and they've given me the most insane growth. So even though they were dormant for a little while, they haven't like they haven't developed issues 
because of it, if that makes sense. Um, but then somebody else said, do you have a Monstera mint slash Thai constellation? And with the Tycon, how do you prevent root rot if you do own one? Um, so I, I currently don't have either in my collection. I have owned a Thai constellation before. And to be completely honest, I got rid of it for this reason. It was just giving me issue after issue after issue. Um, and I think the reason that I struggled, I say I think the reason that I struggled so much with mine, I actually gave my Thai constellation to somebody that I speak to from time to time at one of the London plant swaps. And I think she's getting on really well with it, so it could have been environmental. Um, but, so, a lot of the time nowadays, Thai constellations are tissue culture plants, just because obviously there was a massive demand for them. It's cheaper to do things in tissue culture a lot of the time than it is to just kind of naturally chop and propagate a plant. Um, and from my limited knowledge of tissue culture and how it works and how it affects certain types of plant, I have heard from many, many people that apparently if you do have a tissue culture Thai constellation, it can make them, it can make them much more susceptible to so many things, disease, I was going to say infections, things like root rot, pests even, just because typically, I don't want to say the plant's not as healthy, I think it's resilience to certain things is just not quite so much, and I'm pretty sure that I had a tissue culture Thai constellation, so that kind of makes sense. Um, the Monstera albo, for example, another form of variegated Monstera, is typically, again, I don't have tissue culture plants, but is typically much hardier. I don't tend to have many issues with mine. But yeah, as I say, I have heard that that is very typical with the Thai constellations. So in order to avoid root rot, if I was going back and doing it again, I think I might consider semi-hydro. Um, probably not a fine mix like this I might go for a chunkier mix I know soil ninja do a like a nice chunky semi-hydro mix I think I would probably go for something like that just because you're able to monitor the roots a lot better yeah like I don't know if it was growing amazingly in an organic matter substrate then maybe I would think differently it just comes down to your plant, doesn't it? I, like, and I always say just go with your gut because although things aren't always gonna go right, there's been so many times in life, but with my plant collection specifically, there's been so many times where I feel like I've ignored things. In fact, I'm gonna chop this leaf because it's on its way out. Um, I've ignored things that I know I shouldn't have ignored. Like at the time there was something telling me to do them and I didn't do them. So if you feel inclined one way or the other I would say try it just monitor the plant and accept the fact that you might have to change things up quite quickly if it's not happy yeah that would be that would be my advice I would say oh and I've had lots of questions come in now um someone said do I give my plants super thrive plant food each time I water so I am not familiar with Super, Super Thrive as a brand. I, um, I've used lots of fertilizers over the years, but the one that I absolutely love and I use now is Liquid Gold Leaf, uh, which yes, I do use every single time I water. Um, I don't wanna go ahead and say yes, because I, as I say, I don't know the ins and outs of, of the fertilizer, what it's got in it, what the, like, the balances are, if it's like specifically for one kind of plant, if it's for a certain pH of soil. Um, I would say obviously read the bottle. <laughs> um, and just as kind of like a general rule with most fertilizers, what I would say is if a plant is actively growing, if it's putting out new growth and it hasn't gone into dormancy, then I would continue to fertilize. There are some plant foods that recommend only fertilizing like once every three or four waters. So again, just like read up on that type of fertilizer. Um, but yeah, I personally do fertilize all year round every time I water so long as a plant is still growing. Um, and I have had questions about that before where people have said like, how do you know if a plant's still growing if it isn't like actively giving you a new leaf? 
Um, and this is actually quite a good one to use as an example, the Alocasia Regal Shield. So this one I have continuously fertilised since I've got it. And although like even right now it is not currently giving me a new leaf, if I feel the stem, I can feel it's bulging and I can feel that it's getting ready to give me a new leaf. So although it's not like constantly giving me new growth, it gives me new growth regularly enough for me to know that it isn't ready to stop being fed, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, that would be my advice on that. Also, um, if any of you guys use Super Thrive or you're more, or you definitely will be more familiar with it than I am, um, comment down below, let this person know what you do and then hopefully that will help. Someone asked, what was your favorite part of the holidays? Um, oh, that's really tricky. That's really tricky. Um, what was my favourite part of the holidays? I think probably, so on about five days after Christmas, I can't remember the, the exact date, um, but my mum, bless her, she had shingles right before Christmas. We were meant to be seeing each other on Christmas Eve, but obviously me and Ross weren't well, she had shingles. Um, and so she had a bit of a grotty Christmas and we had a bit of a grotty Christmas and we managed to get together, none of us were 100%, but we managed to get together um, for like our, our Christmas, like I'll, I'll usually do like a separate Christmas for my mum anyway, but me, my mum's boyfriend, Ross, uh, we just, we just had a really nice dinner, we had some drinks, we played some games, it was just really nice and I know that doesn't sound like much, but considering we didn't get the chance to do much this year, that was, for me, probably, probably the highlight. I'm trying to think, we did, yeah, we didn't do anything else. And to be honest, although, although I was ill, and I know I'm banging on about the fact that I was ill, I will stop in a minute. Um, but although we weren't well, it was just quite a nice excuse to just lounge out on the sofa, watch a load of TV, watch loads of Christmas movies, just like, I don't know, like some forced downtime. And I know a lot of the time people will often say like, you don't, you, you get ill when you give yourself a break because your body goes, oh my God, relax. And because of that, it just kind of, like it's, it always puts off getting ill until you do stop. Um, I'm not sure if that's what happened in our case, but yeah, it was quite nice just putting our feet up and just doing nothing at all. Um, I definitely caught up on sleep. There was one day that I slept for about 16 hours, I think, which is pretty crazy. I'm typically, I typically operate on not a huge amount of sleep. Like I go to bed, I mean, actually I go to bed a little bit earlier now that, now that Ross lives here because we kind of go to bed at the same time, but usually around about 10.30. Um, and sometimes I'll like be like ding at five o'clock in the morning and I don't know why, I'm just, I think it's probably my overthinky brain, but I'm just quite an early riser. Um, so yeah, definitely caught up on a lot of sleep, which was very well needed. But yeah, what about you guys? What did you get up to over Christmas? And did you have any standout moments? I know, um, oh, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say actually. Uh, a couple of people on my Patreon had some lovely things happen over their Christmases. Um, I know I've spoken to you guys quite a bit, but I haven't caught up with the rest of you. So yeah, let me know, let me know what, what you were doing. Also, I'm putting all of these plants, I'm now surrounding myself with plants. And I'm gonna probably, oh, I've missed some. Um, I'm gonna probably kick them over when I try and clean. I'm gonna have to attempt to do this delicately. Someone said, how do I get my Hoya Carnosa Crimson Princess to bloom? Um, so, so, I have, I don't think there's like one specific way. I, I think obviously increasing light is a very good way to get Hoyas to bloom. Um, they like to be quite root bound in order to bloom as well. I have noticed that often when you pot upgrade, same with lots of plants, like for example, spider plants often don't give you plantlets unless they're quite root bound. Um, so yeah, avoid repotting too much. I mean, light, warmth, humidity, 
those are really like the best possible things that I can recommend for Hoyas. It does tend to equal not just much faster, fuller growth, but also it does tend to mean that they bloom more. Also from time to time, not being afraid to give them a little prune back. And when I say a prune back, I typically will just take some cups to propagate. But by doing that, obviously by taking off the growth at the ends of the plant, it just helps the plant to encourage any growth back up into the main body. It often makes your plant appear much fuller, but often a lot of that energy can go into the plant forming peduncles, which will then lead to flowers. So yeah, that's what I would personally do. Um, my Hoya Susie Q, actually, the one that I very sadly chopped up at the beginning of this video, but that one, oh my goodness, that is one that has not stopped blooming for me in the time that I've had it. It's given me so many gorgeous flowers, and that one's been either in my window box in my bedroom, so like getting very good all-round all round light, um, or, yeah, in fact, hanging in this window here, so it's been receiving bright, bright light the whole time. And I think that's a common misconception because obviously, uh, as with a lot of plants, as with what I said about Monstera deliciosa earlier, but just because a plant is able to survive, because Hoyas are very well known for being low light plants, and that does mean that yes, they can survive in lower lighting conditions, it doesn't always mean that that plant is gonna, is gonna thrive. And particularly with Hoyas like the Crimson Queen, for example, that does have like variegation on its leaves because it has got variegation those are areas that essentially don't contain any chlorophyll they're not going to be able to effectively photosynthesize in the same way as the green bits so typically those plants will just require a little bit more light anyway um so yeah that is if that was my plant what i would be changing in order to try and get it to bloom but also sometimes like sometimes they just don't <laughs> Sometimes you can do everything right and they just won't flower for you. Like my Hoya Bella, when I first moved in here, my Hoya Bella was like blooming like crazy. I, in fact, I did my, my, my recent, my, a year ago now, my houseplant tour. And I remember my Hoya Bella had like, I think it had about six blooms on it at that point. Oh, my camera battery just died. It still doesn't give me any warning before it does that. So I'll be halfway through talking and my camera will just die. Um, but yeah, my Hoya Bella, it gave me so many blooms in one go. It was blooming for like months on end and it hasn't given me any blooms now in probably six months. And yeah, I, I don't have any like definitive reason as to why that would be. So yeah, sometimes you can appear to be getting everything right and the plant just would do what you want it to do. But yeah, and I'm waffling now. That is what I would personally recommend if it was my plant. What's your favourite and top wish list plant for 2024? Oh, that is such a difficult one. Oh my goodness, that's so hard. Um, so I have got a full wish list plant, 2024 wish list plant video coming in the next week, let's say. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that I didn't have on that list. Oh, okay. One that I, one that I would really, 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 really like to try again with, um, is the Anthurium vichii. It's a plant that I, oh my goodness, don't even have the words to express how much I love it. I think it's just beautiful. I had a vichii in my collection about three or four years ago and it went downhill and I eventually lost the plants. I got a beautiful one from Arrowed Market fairly recently and things just went very wrong and if you watch that video your heart will have broken along with mine because that plant is now no more. I've tried everything to get that plant back and it's a goner and it was so beautiful. I'm honestly still mourning that plant. So yeah, I would love to get, even if it's just a little one, like a healthy, a healthy Vichii this year. I think, oh, I've just thought of so many more. Um, so the Paladiflorum as well. The Paladiflorum has been on my wish list for ages and that is such a massive wish list plant. But I would say, if I had to pick just two right now, the Vichii and the Paladiflorum would be my top. Again, what about you guys? What would you have? Like, if you could pick three top wish list plants for this year, 
whether or not they're actually attainable, what do you think they would be? And why as well? What is it that you love about them? Let me know in the comments below. And then someone's asked what my favourite succulent is. I think this is easy for me. I, I think it's my euphorbias. I know I've got, well actually, in fact now I've got three different types of euphorbia, but I would say probably my euphorbia acrorensis. Um, and I, uh, it's one that I've always really loved. It's the one that's also commonly known as the cowboy cactus, but I think more for me, I'm just so proud of that plant. I'm so proud of how big I've managed to grow it. Um, obviously it's purely come down to conditions. That plant has, apart from what I spoke about earlier when it was by the grow light, has pretty much consistently had very good light. But I've grown it from such a little thing into a plant that is now, I'm pretty sure the same height, if not bigger than me, which is crazy. Um, I will definitely do a growth comparison at some point soon because I feel like although although there's a lot of stuff that's been going very wrong, there's also some things that have been going really well as well. So, so yeah, but I think if I could just pick one, that would be my favourite succulent. That or the jade plant. I do love a jade. And I know maybe it's not the most exciting in the world, but... I just think it's lovely. I think the jade is just lovely and I think it's really underrated. It's very easy to grow. It's very quick to grow. So yeah, those would be uh, my top two. And then I'm just going through these in the order that they've come in, but someone said, how do you grow your planty social media? Um, if you're talking about Instagram, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I am so bad at posting on Instagram. I always try and be better. Um, I don't know why I find it quite draining posting on Instagram, but from people that I follow in the plant community that are very like consistent, I know like people like consistency. I mean, to be honest, the same goes with like, if you count YouTube as social media, which I know it technically is, it just doesn't feel like it for some reason for me. Um, for me, like on YouTube, I think the, the best, like the best piece of advice I could give is, um, yeah, be as consistent as you can be, upload stuff that you want to upload. Like I often find, in fact, a lot of the time I'll find that the videos that I have made in the past that I've made because I feel like I should make, those don't do as well. Um, and usually that's just because my heart's not in them. Um, and typically in the time that I've been on YouTube, the, the videos that used to perform the best for me were ones like, um, like, oh my God, also that's a very loud plane. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but yeah, the ones that used to perform the best were typically like very searchable ones like um, like care videos and stuff like that or like how-to videos and although sometimes they perform well now, the ones that I enjoy making the most and the ones that also perform the best are typically kind of like ones like this where I just chat and do planty stuff with you guys um, and I'm so happy that those are the videos that that you guys like watching because as I say, they are literally my favourite thing to do. It just feels like, yeah, it just feels like kind of hanging out with friends and just chatting and getting to talk through all the things that I want to talk through on a daily basis, but usually don't have anyone there to talk with. So yeah, it also just like holds me accountable and means that I get lots done. And I can absolutely guarantee if I was doing everything that I've done on camera today by myself, I would have got so distracted. I, I, yeah. I, like it just helps me to process things so um so yeah I would say if you're talking about YouTube make the videos that you want to make that might sound really obvious but I think it's potentially the best piece of advice <laughs> also my Hoya Macrophylla this is one that might look like it's doing really well but it's just like, there's been something going on with it for a while. And I'm really hoping that after this pest treatment, I mean, I might have to obviously go back and do more pest treatments, but I'm hoping that maybe it will kind of sort itself out. But I've just found that the last few times I've gone to water it, 
its leaves have been feeling very deflated and flat. And I've had this with Hoyas before. In fact, the one that I think of when I think of like deflated flat leaves is my Hoya Croniana Super Silver. And that's one that, again, I should absolutely write it on that list because I need to get more on top of that plant. I don't know what is going on with that plant and I haven't known what's been going on with it for a really long time. So I know it can be flat mite related, it, maybe this is flat mite related, but I just know that when I have watered this plant, it hasn't hydrated in the way that a healthy Hoya typically does. So, so yeah. Yeah, I've got so much stuff I've been ignoring. Before I do anything else, I'm going to write Croniana Super Silver on my list. Oh, and earlier I said about the Monstera Dubia moss pole, so I will put that on that as well. Okay, so the last one that needs pestreating is the Fuzzy Petiole. And again, I'll just show you in this light to see if you can see any better because it is absolutely riddled to the point that part of me thinks, should I just shop? the foliage back. Mm. Like it doesn't look that bad from there, but oh, I don't know. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this one treatment and then see in a couple of weeks, see how it's doing. Um, oh, cause yeah, it's not good. With ones like the fuzzy petiole as well, because obviously it does have fuzzy petioles. It just means that like getting into all of the little crevices in the petiole is really important because obviously eggs can be in there. And typically using a brush would probably be better. I'm just like squeezing the sponge around it. But yeah, if you've got a makeup brush or something like that, that's typically what I would personally recommend using to get in there. What is your favourite leaf you've grown of all time, current or past? Um, again, this is this is a really tricky one because I feel like, for example, every time my variegated Al alocasia friday gives me a new leaf, it is so exciting. I always love to see the balance of variegation. Um, but I think probably the thing that has got me most excited is when my Monstera dubia started fenestrating, um, just because it had never done that before. And I remember I was just unbelievably excited about it. And the leaves it's giving me now, as I showed you earlier in this video, are absolutely amazing. I'm so, so happy with how that plant is growing for me. But yeah, that, that first fenestration, I remember just feeling like such a proud plant parent and just feeling like, I don't know, I don't know. I feel like that was the biggest buzz I've got from a leaf that I can think of. There's a lot that makes me very happy when I get new growth on it though. Like a lot of, I mean, oh my goodness, my philodendron splendid whenever that one gives me a new leaf because they come in so beautiful and glossy. Oh, that's very exciting as well, so I don't know. But yeah, Monstera Dubia, I think, if I had to say. What's a wish list plant that didn't live up to expectations? Oh. Oh, interesting. Okay, one has literally just sprung to my mind and it's not maybe what I would have thought of if I'd had time to think of it, but it's just in my head. Um, the Anthurium SP Lemon for me, um, and I think that is very much down to my experience growing the plant. Um, so I got that plant at the Rare Plant Festival, oh my goodness, two years ago now, two years ago. Uh, and I was torn between that and I think a, like a type of piper. Yeah, that Piper SP Thailand Silver. I was torn between the two of them and I went with the Anthurium SP Lamont. I thought it was gorgeous. And I just really struggled to grow it. I, I've still got cuttings of the plant that I'm propagating in my prop box, but I gave away, so, I swapped so many at the plant swap last year. Um, I've, I've tipped, yeah, I've just kind of, 
not given up with it, but kind of given up with it, uh, just because I didn't enjoy the way it was growing. And maybe that is just me not being able to get my head around things, but also, I don't know, I just wasn't finding it particularly enjoyable to learn. And like, it's it's kind of rare that I feel like that about a plant. Sometimes a plant will start doing something weird and I'm like, oh, okay, I need to tweak some things, I need to mix it up. And when I kind of crack the code, like again with my Alocasia Fry deck, my variegated one, um, then I will feel so good about things. And I'll be like, oh my God, this is such a rewarding plant. And with that one, I don't know, I just kind of lost my mojo with that plant a bit. And so, so yeah, I guess, I guess that is probably a wishlist plant that didn't meet expectations. But then again, then again, I have got other plants that have been wishlist plants that I've struggled with, but I would want to grow again. Like for example, the Anthurium Rockwianum, I have had so, Oh, this is so bad. Such bad luck with the Warroquianum, the Queen Anthurium. I've had such bad luck with that plant, but I totally want to give it another go this year. I really want to feel like I can get my head around it because it's just amazing. It's such an amazing plant. So yeah, I would probably say the SP Limon for me. Again, what about you guys? Have you got any that you thought you'd really love and they didn't meet expectations? If so, why? Why do you think that is? Uh, how is winter affecting your plants this year? Um, well, so I think I think part of my, my kind of burnout towards the end of the year is due to the fact that there has been a lot of stuff on my part that I haven't been doing to keep my plants happy, but also it is just the time of year for drama in general. Um, so yes, I've had my fair share of drama. I just have, it's just also come at a time where I haven't felt particularly like mentally like I can always keep on top of it. So it's almost in some ways hit me a little bit harder than maybe it would do normally or it has done on other years. Um, I mean, thank goodness we have passed the shortest day now here in the UK. The days are now slowly getting lighter. It's about 20 to four now and I can see a little bit of sunshine outside. It is still, actually it's not raining anymore. Um, but you, like a, a few weeks ago, it would have been pitch black dark at this time. So we're definitely on the up. And I think things could have been, or things could definitely have been worse this winter with my plants, but but yeah, there's there's been I, like I've given my my philodendron splendid quite a big chop back, which broke my heart. But she lost quite a few leaves. Um, I've got an aglaonema, which actually you might have seen in shot at the beginning of this video when I did my artsy shot of making a cup of tea. Um, my aglaonema, um, what's it called? It's called like a zeb a zebra aglaonema or something. Um, next to the kettle, that one has lost so many leaves. I don't quite know. I know I need to get to the bottom of that one as well, again, on the list. Um, but yeah, it's been, been okay. It's been okay. It's been more pest related, if anything, this winter, to be honest. It's been less environmental and more pest. Um, and as I say, I think that's partly just because I haven't been very vigilant when it comes to treating. I haven't had as much space as I'd like to isolate. Um, I also just have have not been good at replacing predatory mite sachets and stuff like that. So a lot of it is things that I could have done differently. But yeah, I'm I'm very much looking forward to the spring. It is, oh my God, it's a time of year that just excites me so much. And although people say your plant care gets more intense during the spring and summer months because everything's growing more, it does to a certain extent, but for me, I also feel like it just kind of becomes effortless. Like I just enjoy it so much more, so much more during the spring and summer months because I feel like I can kind of see the results of everything that I'm doing much quicker. Like plants respond to things much quicker in a positive way on the whole. So yeah, it's, it's something I'm really looking forward to. But yeah, it hasn't been a dreadful winter with plants, I wouldn't say. 
Someone has asked, are you self-taught through experience and research? Um, yes, 100%. I've said it before, like I am absolutely not an expert. I figure everything out as I go. I still very much make mistakes to this day, um, a lot. <laughs> uh, but to be honest, like since I've been on YouTube, it might, l it might look like I know what I'm doing a lot of the time, but half the time, I feel like I'm just trying to figure things out. And then I've got you guys in the comments and you are like, honestly, I know I'm so bad at replying to comments, but I do read every single one of your comments. And there's so many times where someone will say, oh, why don't you try this? And I'll think, oh, you know what, I will try it. And it will literally change the way that I look after that plant. So yeah, the plant community has been purely for me, how I've learned everything, a lot of trial and error. A lot of being a very bad plant parent for a long time. I um I've said it before, but when I first started liking the look of plants, I ha and I think this is the same for probably quite a lot of us, unless you've got lots of planty people, like friends or in your family. But I just I didn't have a clue about like different types of plants and their lighting requirements or how much water they needed. I just kind of thought I remember I had a ficus that I had down in my bedroom and. I was like, well, if I give it loads of water every single day, then it's gonna do much better. And so I would water it all the time. Uh, needless to say, it died very quickly, but, but if I hadn't made these mistakes with plants in the past, then I probably wouldn't feel like I know them now. And like I've just said about plants like the Anthurium warocquianum, that's one that I'm still getting my head around, but at some point, I really hope I'm able to make a video being like, this is how I've managed to figure it out. I haven't done it yet, but, um, but yeah, it's like, I, I love learning as I go with it. It's kind of, it's like anything. It's like, if you're an artist and you're trying to get better at drawing, like you start off and you're not as good and you practice and practice and then eventually your artwork becomes beautiful and it's not always gonna be beautiful. You're still gonna make mistakes, but it's half the fun for me. Like, it's kind of like solving a puzzle and if things were going right, all the time. I don't know, I'd still love the look of plants, but and although I don't like it when things go super wrong, it keeps me busy and it keeps me a lot of the time in a very good mental place. It just kind of, I don't know, soothes me and um, yeah, I love it and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, but, okay, that's all the pest treating that I needed to do here done. I am now just gonna give my cabinet a very quick clean. I've still got some predatory mite sachets at the top there that I can see that I need to throw in the bin. I'm gonna give it a sweep out. I'm gonna give it, what do you call it? A, a sponge down. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm gonna do next. <laughs> Okay, the cabinet is clean. It is so clean. I don't think it has ever been this clean. It is, however, almost dark now. It actually looks lighter on camera than it is in real life, but I need to get Yoli out for a W because I can hear her clawing at the door. She's with Ross next door. And she's been out once today already for a walk, but she is being demanding. So I'm gonna get her out for another quick walk. It will likely then be dark, but I will come back and we can water everything, carry on with the Q&A because it's quite fun going through your questions and then, yeah, get everything back into the cabinet nice and clean and feel like we have accomplished today. So yeah, let's get Yoli out.
just got back from the dog walk and Yoli has just walked straight through the plants much more delicately. Oh no, don't you do it again. I was going to say than she usually would, Yoli, no. Go around the other way, go the other way. Well done. I've also made a much more suitably sized cup of tea. Ross got me this mug for Christmas and I mean, I'm a fan of a big mug, but this is teetering on Super Bowl territory, which I really quite enjoy. So seeing as the bottom layer of plants, I couldn't see any pests on. I'm going to start with them because I do tend to reuse my water. And I know obviously if you are using the water and then reusing it on a plant. Wow, bad way of explaining it. If you are using the water to water a plant that's got pests and then using it on a plant that doesn't, you can very easily spread it. But I think if I start at the bottom and then work my way up, then it should be okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna do the standard watering method that I like to do, which is just oven rack bowl, just because it's easy. Oh my God, my strength. Um, but quite a few more questions have come in in the time that I've been out. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep going through them in order. Um, someone said, pet safe plant that looks rare. I have a puppy and I'm now having and I'm now having to safely jungle up my living room. Oh, I mean, I think, oh, a pet safe plant that looks rare. I think the thing that always comes to mind first for me is calatheas, because calatheas are such beautiful plants. You can get them in such beautiful varieties. Hoyas as well, you can get some incredible hoyas. My um, Hoya latifolia sarawak, for example, I think that is, like maybe I'm biased, but it is one of the most unusual, rare looking plants and that's pet safe. Um, so yeah, I think probably those would be the ones that I would recommend. Um, like a medallion Calathea, for example, or Calathea roseopicta. I feel like that would be a good shout. I've also got a Hoya here, um, which I always get the name wrong of. It's a Hoya globulosa welsh mountain zoo but i always want to call it a hoya tanga moose and i think that looks so unusual and so like quote unquote rare um I, i'm assuming as i've said in so many other videos everyone's definition of the word rare is different um but yeah again another another pet friendly one i think it's gorgeous but um i guess just with a puppy i mean i've been so lucky in the sense that yoli has never paid any attention to the plants at all and sometimes you can get really lucky but I appreciate that obviously if it's a new puppy you probably want to be extra cautious um just things that like I don't know like trailing plants and things that might be like tempting to grab and nibble just be careful of that and like obviously making sure that spiky plants are up out of the way as well my big euphorbias are currently in the corner and even then I have to be very careful about like myself walking past them let alone Yoli because they are very very sharp and can hurt ah and then someone said are you happy with your cabinet I know you've had some pest issues um on the whole on the whole I'm happy with my cabinet I'm not gonna lie my cabinet has been I think probably these last couple of months it has been getting me down a little bit just because I have had lots and lots and lots of issues in there and it hasn't been like, I don't know, I look in there and I just see a lot of plants that don't look very well but I feel like after, I mean getting it cleaned up today, I know I'm going to feel so good. I, like when I finish filming this video I know I'm going to feel so happy with myself that I've actually done it. It looks sparkling, I'm so happy with it. And actually, on the whole, a lot of the issues in my cabinet are not as bad as I thought they were going to be. I think sometimes it's just, it's just the thought of, like, the, the what-ifs that kind of stop me from, like, getting in there and doing things sooner. So, so yeah, on the whole, I'm really happy with my cabinet. I feel like it keeps my plants very happy. It just can be a little bit of a nightmare if you do get a pest infestation because everything is crammed in one space. It will, unless you catch it super early, it will almost inevitably spread. Also, something I'm really excited about, I know I said earlier in the video that I ordered another set of shelves to go by my big windows. And as I was coming back from the dog walk, there were some Amazon parcels at the bottom of the stairs. And one of them is the shelves. So I'm hoping maybe, I don't know, maybe tomorrow I might get them set up and I can get some plants on there. I just want to space things out a little bit. Because, I mean, in the same way as, like, with a cabinet environment, 
when things get very crammed together and pests and stuff like that can spread, it's not always quite as easy to monitor things when you're just seeing like a sea of green as opposed to individual plants. And don't get me wrong, I love the sea of green, but I just feel like if I could space things out a little bit more, I'd be able to monitor them a little bit better. And so yeah, that is, that is my plan. That's what I'm gonna try and do. And I feel like by doing things that way, things are not gonna be quite so overwhelming. Logically, that makes sense. I just need to stick to that. I need to, I just need, I feel like keep reminding myself of that because I just go into panic mode so easily. What was the question again? I've gone on such a tangent. <laughs> Do you have a favorite plant genus? Um, yes, I do. It's, it's, it's really tricky because there's a few that I am slightly torn between, but I think if I had to say, if I look at the diversity of my collection and the plants that consistently make me happy and the plants on my wish list, I would say my favourite genus is probably philodendron. Oh, that's a, again, that's a tough one though. I feel like I kind of swing back and forth. Alocasia and Anthurium are also very close. Oh, but hi, oh. I feel like philodendron is one that I always kind of come back to, so therefore, therefore I would say philodendron, currently. Uh, and someone else has also just said, did Yoli ever try to eat any of the plants when you first got her? As I said just now, no, she didn't. She, in that sense, has always been a very good girl. Um, and I mean, the way that I kind of looked at it, because I, like, as I say, I absolutely think you should take precautions and I definitely think you should monitor your pets around plants and do not, like, don't just leave poisonous plants down at ground level if you, like, if you don't know your pets. But I also do feel like, if you if you let your dog off a lead, if you let your cats go out in the garden, they're like every other plant that they encounter in the wild every single day is, well, m most of them or a lot of them, sorry, are toxic. Um, and like I'm not saying like Yoli has never like she'll occasionally eat grass, but she's never eaten an outdoor plant and in the same way as that she just doesn't really pay any attention to them in the house. I definitely don't want this to sound like I'm not saying be careful because you totally totally should. When I first got Yoli I did have a lot of plants and I absolutely monitored her. I was watching her like a hawk and the first few months that she was sleeping downstairs I literally moved all of the plants out of that space so that she wasn't alone with any of them. But after a while when she's literally just ignoring them I was just like, you know what, she's fine, she's fine. Um, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely be cautious because there's lots that are very, very poisonous and obviously the same goes if you've got children or just people in the house that are prone to eating things. I feel like when I stand back from my cabinet after this, it's gonna be so satisfying because it's just been looking a little bit grubby for a while. It's gonna look so nice and fresh. Here I've got some Anthurium clarinervium babies that I took to the last plant swap as little seedlings and, and no one wanted to swap. I got to the end of the day and I was like, oh my God, I got rid of as much as I could and I didn't want to put them on the free table. So I was like, I'll bring them home and I'll grow them. I'll grow them in my own collection. But they're all cling filmed up and labeled still. And I've just kind of left them like that. I mean, they're so low maintenance and they are growing. It should probably be potted up at some point soon because they are getting quite big. I don't know if you can tell in there, but that is oh, probably another job for the list. Although it's not a pressing job. They could, in theory, probably stay like that for another month or two and be okay. So I'm not gonna write that one down for now. And I'm not quite sure how I'm feeling about my philodendron painted lady. I chopped her back earlier this year. I think, again, I think probably because of thrips. And she's she's growing back well. Again, I should probably get her on a moss pole. 
There's some plants that I'm really excited to get onto moss plows or I'm really excited to stake and there's others that I'm just like, I, I don't know. Does that say something about me and the plant? I don't know. Moss poles take up so much room. And for some plants that I'm determined to grow like as big as possible, I'm totally up for doing it. And I'm not saying that I want to keep this one small, but I kind of, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. Does anyone else relate to that? Like when I think about getting my Monstera dubia on a moss pole, I'm like, yes. When I think about this one, I'm like, eh but I'm not quite sure what my plans are for this plant currently because it's not overly exciting me. I currently wouldn't want to part with it, but I feel like maybe it's one that this year I could bring myself to part with. I'm not feeling the love as much as I'd like to be. When you take a plant out of the Millsbo, which is this cabinet, into room conditions, how do you do it? How do you do it gradually? How? Um, so yes, I, oh, it depends on the plant to be honest. Some are pretty hardy and some you can't, like for example, if I take a Hoya out of my cabinet, I don't really do that much acclimation to normal conditions. I will just kind of let it be. And typically, I mean, typically it's fine. I don't think I've ever had issues. If I've got alocasia, alocasia and certain types of philodendron that are a little bit more sensitive, but allocasia mainly just because they can be a little bit temperamental to changes I do try to make quite a gradual process and what I will usually do is typically obviously the conditions in my cabinet are like consistent light very good humidity very good heat I will try my best to kind of keep that as similar as possible for like the first couple of weeks um my variegated allocasia fry deck actually is the one that I can't stop talking about and it is a pretty good example of that because when I first took that plant out of the cabinet I was so terrified because everything was going wrong at that point I was so terrified that everything was just going to continue to go wrong so I took it out of the cabinet and I put it next to my other mother grow light which is exactly the same as this it emits the exact like it replicates the exact same light. It was on the same timer system. So the light it was getting was literally identical. I've got my humidifier like in between, like next to where it was. So it was getting very good levels of humidity. Um, and to be honest, that like, that was kind of enough to replicate what it had been getting in there, but in the room. And then gradually you can just move it back from the light and back from the humidifier and it will just gradually learn to tolerate room conditions. Wow, I feel like there was a much more straightforward way of saying that. But yeah, that's typically what I do. I find having a spot, like a spot in my house that is kind of like this, but not kind of means that I can create a step-by-step -step acclimation to room system. Like for example, I know obviously humidity spreads in the room, but over by my radiator, I keep a lot of like plants like Hoyas and stuff like that that don't need as much humidity. And over on this side, I tend to keep more of my like tropical foliagey plants um that's just how I've done it and that is how it's worked for me I think like I don't know if I had a plant that was like for example in terrarium conditions so think prop box because obviously my cabinet currently isn't sealed although it gets very high levels of humidity it's not like it's not like it's at like a hundred percent humidity if I'm taking something out of a prop box then typically what I will do is I will either like take it out and put it straight into a cabinet and then do the transition. I'll kind of add that into the step. Okay, I'm explaining this so poorly. To simplify things, what I would say is if you're trying to acclimate a plant from either propagation box, cabinet, whatever environment you're trying to acclimate a plant from, if you're trying to acclimate an import, for example, do your best to replicate the conditions that it was in before and then just tone those conditions down. So as I say, if you're able to keep, like if it's a plant that's been right under the grow light here, I will put it right by the grow light over there, for example, or I'll put it right by the window where it's getting similar light. I don't know why I'm finding that like, I think I'm really tired. <laughs> Everything's just tripping me up. Um, but yes, that's what I do. I hope that made sense. If it didn't, I'll try and answer it better in another video or I'll put text on the screen because I feel like that was an awful, an awful attempt at speaking. 
I also feel like my cabinet is not only going to look lovely and clean, but it's also going to look very empty because obviously I'm not putting my Anthurium Regal back into it and I'm not going to be putting my Philodendron Fuzzy Petiole back into the top. So it's going to look very empty indeed. Again though, probably better and easier to monitor. This moss pole is bone dry. It's going to need a few waters through. Moss becomes so hydrophobic when it's allowed to completely dry out. So I'm going to just water the main plant. And I'm going to put this here and I'll water it again in a moment because that is still very dry. Somebody's asked, how do I care for poinsettia so that I can continue growing it all year? Um, so I, I am personally not a fan of poinsettia, so I don't have one in my collection currently. I have been gifted them before, especially at Christmas. If you're not familiar with them, they're the ones that have the big red leaves and they look like flowers and you can get them in white as well. You can also get them variegated, typically associated with the holiday season. And my mum has one a couple of years ago and we did manage to keep, well, we managed to keep hers alive all year round, but I'm pretty sure they are seasonal, like they will naturally die off when it gets to spring, I think. Um, again, I'll put a little bit more information on the screen, but I'm pretty sure the way that we got hers to regrow is we chopped it right back. Yeah, in fact, I remember it was literally a stump in a cup for ages. We chopped it right back and then come, I think, like end of August, September time, it started like you could just see little buds and then it turned into growth and then it was looking beautiful again by Christmas. It's a very strange plant, but I'm pretty sure that's how we did it. Um, but yeah, I'm not like, I wish I could give you more useful information on that, but I'm not the best person to ask just because, as I say, it's not a plant that I've actively tried to keep alive because I'm not a huge fan. Do you ever have issues with mould in your moss propagation containers? Um, yes, I have done in the past. Recently, not that I can think of. Um, typically, I find that once you create, assuming you're using like fresh, clean sphagnum moss, if the environment is truly sealed, like you're using like a the box that I made earlier, for example, that's got clips that kind of properly makes it airtight. I haven't found it to be a massive issue. I've actually found moss to, uh, mold, sorry, to be more of a problem when you've got ventilation in there. And I don't know exactly why that is. And I know some people make kind of like terrarium, terranium type cabinets and have like moss going all the way up. Um, but then on the flip side, when I'm propagating in moss, just like in, in natural room conditions, air circulation seems to be really, really important. And without that, you do get mold. So I'm not quite sure what the like, the straightforward answer is. Like for example, I've got a moss pole over there and if I didn't have a fan that ran behind it sometimes, I know that that moss pole would get moldy because it is just sitting constantly damp. Um, but with my propagation boxes, I think the other key is just not to leave them too wet. Like that causes mold and rotting in itself. So I always make sure that the moss is like lightly damp. Like you pick it up and it doesn't, like it obviously doesn't feel dry. It feels nicely damp. But if you were to squeeze it, water won't like pour out of it. Um, but yeah, so that is what has worked for me. But I know like it is just something that happens sometimes. Like. I, as I say, it has happened to me in the past and it's so frustrating, I know, when it does happen, but I think just monitor your prop boxes. Like, I do just check on mine every kind of, like, I don't know, four or five weeks, even if I just open the lid and I have a look at them and I see what's going on. Um, that's also such a lie. I don't check on them every four or five weeks. I've got one specifically that I don't think I've opened since, like, I don't know, mid-summer. Um, I try to check on them every four or five weeks, uh, but equally as well, if you switch to something like perlite instead of sphagnum moss for propagating, I find that that very rarely comes along with mould issues. So that might be something to think about. Um, oh my God, I was going to say, I've got one more plant on the bottom level. And then that's going to be it. That feels so empty compared to how it was before. This feels so strange. 
lots of space for new plants. No, 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 I won't. Oh, I kind of want to. No, I won't. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to water all of the top level here and then I'm going to put them back in because I can't be bothered to be going up and down. And I'm also, firstly, just going to change my camera battery because I have a feeling it's about to die on me and I don't want it to cut me off again. Fabulous! Nearly there. Oh my goodness, I feel like I've made really good progress today. Sometimes, like, sometimes I will set out to do things in videos, like I'll be like, right, okay, I'm gonna get loads done today and I'll finish and I'm like, actually, I don't feel like I got that much done. But I think today, like even just getting into my cabinet and cleaning it and doing that, honestly, that is just such a big thing. It's such, it's just something that I hate, I, like I typically hate doing, but it's actually been quite fun. So fun, is fun the right word? I don't know. I hope if you guys are doing stuff, especially stuff that you don't want to do, I really hope that yours is going well as well. How do you guys, like, again, comment below, but how do you find, like what way, what am I asking? <laughs> what are some of the best ways you found to motivate yourself to do things that you don't want to do or aspects of plant care for example that you don't want to do like the cleaning and tidying and maintaining in that sense how do you how do you keep yourself focused um i know a lot of people say do something that you really like alongside that thing and that's why like i mean i myself watch other youtubers repot and chats i watch like lots of planty content when I'm doing things. I listen to music, I listen to podcasts, but I also really just like, as I say, doing things, doing things this way because I feel like often when I'm talking through stuff with you guys, I'm able to just, I don't know, time just seems to fly in a way that it doesn't always when I'm doing it by myself. Sometimes it totally does. Sometimes I can go right into it and I can be like, whoa, where's the day gone? And I'll have been doing planty stuff for like six hours straight. But typically I really like doing it this way. So thank you for being here to do it with me. And then I've got my pile of ones that I wasn't sure about. And I did put my begonia elbow picture in there because this one is just constantly looking very sad. And I just don't know how much I care about it anymore. I definitely feel I'm being more brutal this year already. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them back in the cabinet just for the time being. Oh, in fact, these were bottom shelf plants. Okay, you know what, I'm gonna keep them out and I'm gonna water them separately. But yeah, I've got a few there that I'm not, sure about and I often think like if there's a plant that I didn't have any more would like when it's one that I'm not sure about if I didn't have any more firstly would I be sad and would I even really notice does it just make way for either me to be a little bit more attentive to my current collection or a potential new plant and I, oh, I wish I wish buying new plants wasn't so addictive because honestly, even, even at times where I'm like, nope, I'm not getting any more, I'm just going to focus on what I've got, I always just find myself just even looking at cuttings and I'm like, oh, it's only one more, it'll be fine. And then only one more turns into only ten more and then, and then we're back to feeling overwhelmed. So I'm going to try and be better. I know Emma did, um, she did her one-in, one-out system for quite a lot of last year and she basically said if she was going to get... I mean, it's exactly as it sounds. If she was going to get a new plant, then she would have to get rid of something in her current collection. And I don't know if I could do that, but I think, in principle, I think it's a very good idea. So I will consider. I'll just be a little bit more mindful, I think, about how, how I buy plants this year. Because I obviously will. How is your vape quitting going? If you want to talk about it. Uh, yes, I am quite proud to talk about it actually. It's going really well. I haven't vaped now since the uh, end of, well, 1st of November. I, I decided that I was going to stop for Stoptober and that's, so October, November, December, 
and that's like four months now so yeah I'm I'm really I'm honestly I'm so proud of myself I feel just much better in myself and I feel like it's been a good trigger oh my god whoa almost dropped a plant um it's been a good trigger to try and like form healthier habits in my life in general like um I think I said before Christmas but I pretty much stopped drinking I've been trying to I mean none of this applies to the new well actually I haven't drunk in the new year but uh I was gonna say like running as well I started going running at the end of last year um just, just trying to take a little bit better care of myself and it feels easier now that I'm not constantly putting nicotine into my body um I think it's also just something that it, it's a habit that I, or that, like, I didn't want to be doing. I couldn't realistically see myself quitting because I tried to quit so many times before and it just never happened. Um, I started smoking quite young as well. Like, I, I think I just, I don't know, I thought it was cool. Um, and it's just something that, like, it's just become one of those things that I, or, like, I'm pretty sure I have been I've been I've had nicotine in my body for more of my life than I haven't um and yeah so I just never thought that I'd do it and I feel really amazing having stopped so yeah I um if any of you if any of you are also trying to quit like stick with it I know it is so incredibly tough honestly um I've spoken about it a little bit on Patreon but I have throughout my life kind of struggled with addiction in different forms and um, one hundred percent nicotine is probably the hardest thing that I've ever like stopped. So, um, so yeah, I know how difficult it is, and I know that it's such a social thing as well. And still, like, if you're out to the pub or like you're with your friends and they smoke, I know you want to be doing it as well. So I like, I mean, I just I don't know. I'm such a fidgeter. Like, I like having. I usually wear lots of rings, and I usually kind of play with them, or I play with my necklace, or like pens and stuff and having things to be able to do that with helps um also for me things like I've like these are just these aren't like tips to quit because none of these like were the thing that made me quit but they just have helped um I've also got a water bottle now with spout um and often when I'm feeling like I want to like pick up my vape I will have a sip of water instead which is obviously much healthier um but yeah, so that's how it's going. It is going good. Um, oh, and we are almost, almost there with the plants. Oh no, hang on a lie. There's quite a few more that are tucked behind me. I'm so sad I broke a leaf off this one. Oh my goodness. Oh. I think this is when Yoli ploughed through these earlier. It's most beautiful leaf, that one there. The stem snapped. <sighs> I mean, I might be able to tape, I mean, to be honest, it might be okay. It's not an awful break, but, oh, that's a shame. Maybe I'll try and stake that back. I need like a toothpick or something really, really fine because otherwise that's just going to weigh the whole thing down. I might just prop it up against the side of the cabinet. Damn it. Damn it. Not a good day for that plant. Is the variegated Hoya macrophylla the same as Alatifolia albomarginata? Um, yes, I believe so. I believe it is. I know that Mac, oh, which way around is it? Please, a Hoya expert, comment below and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, some of you guys are so amazingly clued up on Hoyas. It blows my mind um, and makes me want to be better and learn more. Um, but I'm pretty sure the macrophylla is a latifolia. In fact, I think it was previously classified as macrophylla and now it's actually latifolia, but people still say macrophylla. Am I right about that? Um, and yeah, the variegata albo marginata, albo margin just is albo margins. I'm pretty sure they are the same. They are definitely often sold as the same thing. Um, sorry, it was a vague answer, but I'm pretty sure yes. Confirmation in the comments. Anybody who knows, please confirm or deny. <laughs> 
And this is the Rafa de Forza Cursiva, and it's really, really curly at the moment. Um, and I know a lot of you said that if it didn't, like, I think it's actually a crawler. I've never owned it before, but a lot of you said that if it didn't have like a substrate to crawl along, then it would get quite runnery. And I've just noticed it's put out that section there that doesn't have any foliage. So I'm gonna just for now, try and encourage it back down into the soil that it's in. And obviously it's quite a fast grower, that's not gonna do it for long, but then I can upgrade its pot and see if there's any way of potentially making it a little bit more upright. I am, um, it's so annoying. I, there's so many crawling plants that I love, but I just don't like the fact that they're crawlers. Like I will love the foliage and I'll look it up like, oh my God, I want that plant. And then I'll see it's a crawler and I'm like, oh, just because they take up so much space. The only one that I like forever has my heart and I just will never part with is my philodendron Dean McDowell. And I am so not looking forward to the day that I have to chop that one. I mean, to be honest, it's not gonna be far off. It's giving me so much new growth, even at this time of year, even in probably the lowest light spot in this room, it's giving me so much growth. But yeah, as I say, I know, I know I am gonna to have to chop it at some point soon. I think my dream is at some point to have like a really, I was gonna say a really big house, I don't want a really big house, a really big long wall in a room, maybe at the next place I live, um, and have like a really long trough planter going along like, I don't know, a shelf in that room or something and just having it growing all the way along. I think that would be beautiful and then I wouldn't have to chop it. That would probably, most likely, have to be a DIY trough planter. But I reckon it's possible, I reckon it's doable. <laughs> Hello, darling. <laughs> Can I come out and play, please? <laughs> I'm nearly done. What I've got, I've got like two, you... more, two more plants to water and then I need to put them back into my cabinet. I've cleaned my cabinet. You promised me <laughs> 40 minutes nearly an hour ago. Yeah. Go and play by yourself. I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> Go away for the time being. Or you can help me water and put things back in my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one that was in the spider mighty pile and I have treated, but this is one of my Anthurium clarinerviums. And this leaf here, oh, camera's not focusing, why is it not focusing? Okay, for some reason it just doesn't want to focus. I'll put a clip of it in. Um, but that leaf there, although it's been a little bit spider mited, is starting to really get the Clarinervium form. Like I can see the white veination and that's making me so happy because all of the ones so far have been sizing up, but they've still been very seedlingy. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really excited about this one because so far all of my Clarinervium seedlings are still quite juvenile. They just take such a long time to get going. So yeah, I'm excited to see what it does next. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I have been doing planty stuff much longer than I thought I would be, but I've just got quite carried away today. And as I said before, it's quite a nice feeling because I feel like I can just blitz through stuff whilst talking to you guys and I get so much done without almost feeling like I've got so much done. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. And that is everything from the top shelf watered as well. So I just need to get it back into the cabinet and then go play with Ross. <laughs> so let's get everything back in and then admire how beautiful the cabinet looks. Oh my goodness, look how sparkly and clean my cabinet looks, but also look how much space I've got in there. I feel like just from going through and having a bit of a reorganise and taking some of the bigger things out, it's just made such a difference. Like it's now so beautiful to look in there, whereas before I found it just to be 
not an eyesore, but it was just getting me down a little bit. And I am so genuinely happy with that. Also, look at Yoli. She's so tired. She's so tired. Hey, baby. But yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I feel like it's probably been a fairly long one. So as I say, if, you, if you've been doing stuff as well, I really hope it's all gone well. I hope you've got lots done. I will definitely, definitely be doing a part two to this doing a part two to this video in the next few days because I, although I've got through a lot I've still got much more to get through I've got my Christmas tree just here my big monstera that I decided to decorate I need to get that de-Christmasfied I've got lots of brooding and watering and all sorts to do so so yeah bear with for more plant plant chorsy videos but yeah I hope you all have a lovely evening and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day, and I will see you in the next video. Stay sexy, plant lovers. <laughs>